Hello and welcome to episode number 82 of the Know Your Physio podcast. I'm your host, Andres Prichel, helping you discover your science to optimize your life. And today's guest is Alejandro Guerra Mendruit. He's an aerospace engineer. He's the business developer in the space sector at GTD and a career astronaut candidate at Advancing X. So this marks our second episode in our mini series with Advancing X and their career astronaut program, where we get to know who is training for the next space missions what does it take and what can we take away from the amazing things that they learn on a daily basis to take our personal health well-being and performance further than ever before well today we have alejandro to tell us literally what it takes physically mentally physiologically to perform higher and further than ever before so Hope you guys enjoy this amazing episode. If you want a more elaborate introduction to Advancing X and what they're all about, I was just tuning into the previous episode, number 81, where I kick off this mini series with our first guest, Eleanor Pulley. As always, you can reference the show notes for any related links and resources if you want to learn more. And with that being said, let's go ahead and jump right into this episode with Alejandro. Hope you guys enjoy the show and we'll see you on the other side. Alejandro, here we are. It's great to have you on the Know Your Physio podcast. Welcome to the show. Uh, Appreciate it. I know that there's a lot that we can cover today, but I want to start with why. Why do you do everything that you do? Hello, everyone. I'm, I'm very glad to be here. Very glad to have your platform to come here with you and speak and have a chat here this afternoon in Spain. I guess it's a midday in the in the in the other side of the Atlantic. So, so while responding to your question, um, I guess it just comes up to uh, to a dream of a five-year-old um, kid that has been evolving during the years until now that I'm 25. Um, I, w- I wanted to be an astronaut when I was a kid, and it was uh, something that I consider that I was lucky in the way that I knew what I wanted to do in life. So that helped me just define my career over the years in high school, in the university. You know, it's really, it's really normal for people really common to not know what to do. Uh, in my case, I, I knew since, since the beginning that just it made things easier, right? right? It's thanks to that now I'm working in the space sector. I'm very happy. And, and I, was, I was saying before, this, uh, this desire to become an astronaut has evolved until the point where I'm now, which I'm very, very committed to contributing to society via space science. That will be my statement. That's what I do. I think uh, space is a great way, it's a very direct way to contribute to human development. And I think that it's something worth to live for it. And so did you see early on when you first wanted to embark on this journey to become an astronaut when you were way young, did you see that role as having that kind of impact or was it from the beginning something that you looked up to that you wanted to do because it was cool you know for lack of a better word is did, did, how, how has that perspective evolved and when did you realize that your being an astronaut would actually contribute to humanity and the rest of the world well i think it's something that also evolves as you grow and at the beginning, of course, there's this astronaut uh, thing. I think it, I wanted to be an astronaut because uh, we learned a song at school about an astronaut that went to, to the moon and they, uh, he, slipped, uh, he slept on the stars. And well, that, that was the beginning of it. And then it evolved during the years. Uh, I didn't see, I don't see actually now an astronaut as the front cover man of the space industry. I see it more as, as a piece that maybe the last piece that helps something happen, for example, making a, an experiment in space, there's always uh, a bunch of people behind you that is actually the ones in charge of the experiment and you are just a tool at the end of the day that helps get to the final milestone which is performing the experiment in orbit. Uh, I see an astronaut like a puzzle piece of, uh, of the big uh, space sector and also, I see it like a figure on which 
people, young people, kids can see themselves represented. I think that's why it's really important to have diversity, any type of diversity in a, in a space exploration, especially in astronaut crews. So people can see themselves represented and can uh, develop the same desire that I, I had when I was a kid. Absolutely. And how do you see your unique skills in uh, applying to that level of diversity? Because I'm sure that the diversity doesn't just mean, you know, your cultural background and life experience, but you know, in terms of skills, I know that astronauts play very distinct roles, but these roles and these skills come together to form part of a, of a bigger team. So what are some of the skills that represent what it takes to be an, an astronaut? It's, it's curious because uh, I would say there's three main areas that cover the, the astronaut, the perfect astronaut, which is actually being a perfect astronaut doesn't exist because uh, for being an astronaut, you have to be the most normal person on Earth, literally, right? Uh, we have on, on the professional side, there is, of course, your, your background, your technical background. Uh, I'm an aerospace engineer, and it's curious because uh, being an aerospace engineer actually makes it even more difficult because a lot of aerospace engineers want to, they want to be an astronaut. And now that we are exploring Mars, we are, we, are, we are willing to explore other planets, satellites, and so on. We need other specialities, for example, geology, medicine, uh, also um, <clears throat> physical science sciences for studying the, the behavior of the human body uh, in orbit and in other, in other planets. So at the end of the day, there's a bunch of different um, skills that can make you get into space, actually. One of the astronauts I know, this this is from, from NASA, uh, he's a photographer. He's basically a photographer and he was sent to the ISS to take pictures, to do a dissemination, to communicate what they were doing. And, and he was a photographer. And of course, he had a bunch of other different capabilities and skills, but his technical background was photography. So uh, that's very valuable. On the other side, you have the physical, uh, the physical condition, right? Um, this might be... This might be one of the things that gets out of your control the most. That's why one, uh, if you want to become an astronaut, I always say, it, right, it's it's not a matter of what you do because there's a lot of things you cannot control. So there's no no point to be stressed in the way that if I wanted to be a doctor, I can work. I can work myself for many, many years until I achieve it. Um, for being an astronaut, there's many physical disabilities that are even out of your control or maybe can happen in the future to your body that you cannot uh, do nothing right so at the end of the day there's no point to be stressed so physical conditions you should be normal basically you shouldn't have any major disabilities that could get into you uh, that could get in trouble uh, get you in trouble when you're in space but at the same time here in europe at the european space agency uh, we have just launched um uh, astronaut disability program which uh, has selected one disabled astronaut uh, and they are trying to train him in this case he's a, he's an astronaut male and they're trying to train and study his body so uh, eventually he can get to the ISS and perform the same task as normal astronauts uh, I wouldn't say normal I would say uh, physically able astronauts are able to and, and while this is regarding the physical part, and finally, there's the, the mental part, right? For being the mental part, maybe this one relates the most with the first statement I was saying that for being an astronaut, you should be the most normal person on Earth in the way that you don't have to be a superhero. If they throw you a, an ice cold back, uh, bucket of water, you need to complain that it's cold. It's not like I'm a superhero. <laughs> I'm not complaining. Uh, you need to understand people. You need to... Uh, learn how to hear, how to discuss things, how to live with other people in, in a very, very small, confined space. So so being an astronaut will be the completely opposite of being a robot in, a, in the mental part, right? You should, be, you should be a human because that's what we are at the end of the day, humans. And you're fulfilling something that technology can't fulfill. That's why you're there to do the job, you know? This isn't yes. a job where you can simply, that can't be replaced by robots because of the level of empathy, trust, uh, communication, and other personal, interpersonal skills that, that form part of an amazing team to accomplish these amazing missions. Um, you know, you mentioned how being in space takes a toll on your physical, your physiological, 
from what I understand, you know, when you're suspended in the air, my background is in physiology. If when you're suspended in the air, you're not going to have the impact that your body needs to support high bone mineral density, to support, you know, muscle mass. But are there any other concerns physically or physiologically that you need to be trained for and prepared for? Um, yeah, sure. Um, there's uh, studies that are going on now. Uh, for instance, uh, two years ago, there was uh, these uh, twin crew, two astronauts that were brothers, and um, they went up to the International Space Station. One stayed for a reduced period of time, and the other one stayed for a year to study exactly what are the physical um, conditions that might appear in the long term. Because we know how, how the body behaves in short term, and but not in the long term, right? So uh, at now, what we have is a uh, is uh, many many studies that are certifying that being in orbit, as you mentioned, takes a toll on on your bones, especially on your muscles, and might not take a toll at the short term, but maybe in 30 years. And um, so that's why astronauts make exercise in space, prepare um, for for space uh, for space exploration for for the space flight mission, and. And I, I was. It, this is curious because I'm I'm friends of a I'm friend of a of an astronaut training, a very young astronaut trainer. He also is a professional runner in, here in Spain, and and he was explaining to me right the the type of training that astronauts at the European Astronaut Center undergo. Uh, we're talking about explosivity. We are talking about muscle resilience. Um, um, trying to do exercise not to lose bone density. Uh, the effects might come from atrocities, osteoporosis. I'm not sure if I'm saying the, the correct words in English, but uh, we're talking about always these kind of things. Also, the fact that you are not being, uh, you are suspended, you are not <clears throat> holding your weight onto some surface also makes some parts of your body not being used to carry weight anymore. So that might also take a toll. Of course, I'm not a specialist in uh, physiotherapy, and and I cannot say more than this, but but there's of course one of the main reasons to go to the ISS is just to study the behavior of the body. Right. And what about the psychological toll uh, being out in space? Have you had a chance to examine that? How do you prepare for something like that? This is this is curious, right? Because um, um, even astronauts uh, in the space station have have issues in uh, in a confined environment have some, uh, some situations where, of course, some rumors say that many crews in the, astronaut, uh, in the International Space Station have had some trouble uh, in long missions to communicate and sometimes an, an MCC, the Mission Control Center on Earth, has had to mediate. That's why there's the figure of the Capcom in the MCC. The Capcom is, a, is usually an astronaut also that is in charge of communicating with the crew. Why is it an astronaut? Because um, because he knows what the crew is feeling now firsthand, so he's trying to mediate, to communicate some tests, some issues, some situations that might appear and need to be addressed. So even astronauts are are subjected to a stress in a confined space. We also see that in analog missions here in Earth on Earth, that some missions have to be even interrupted uh, because one astronaut might not feel well, might feel frustrated, something goes wrong and you don't really know how to solve it. It, does, it, it doesn't have to be a, a big thing, right? But some experiment might go wrong and it can take a toll on your mental health because you were preparing for that for a long, long time. So being able to manage this, not only by yourself, but with the help of the others and the crew on Earth, is essential for the success of the mission. And what, what you guys do training at specific I mean I know that you guys do training that um, helps you prepare for you know the intensity for the unexpected but is there any more specific psychological means of training to prepare for those frustrations that you may experience in space yes I think the the first the first barrier when it comes to mental health is the selection process that's the the basic thing and you undergo uh, if you want to be an astronaut, uh, especially two years ago in the last astronaut selection, uh, here in Europe there was um, there was two phases where psychological tests were uh, were 
uh, evaluated in every candidate. We're talking about 22,000 candidates for uh, six, around six spots in Europe. It's not like in the US where some astronaut selections occur every six, seven months. In Europe is maybe each 10 years. So the selection wow. process is harder, right? So that, that's the first, that's the first uh, obstacle. And of course, um, then it comes a training. What kind of training you, you might say? We're talking about going with your crew for an expedition in the Arctic. Uh, that might uh, help you understand the behavior of your crew, the personality of each other, and might have a direct impact on your mental health. Um, on your or your mental capability, your mental resilience. So as long as I know, of course, I'm, I'm not a specialist in, uh, in in psychology, but these kind of activities of field activities are the ones that prepare the crew the most for uh, for the space mission, either in the Arctic, in caves, in the desert. That's why we uh, do uh, these kind of things. Also, last last summer in the U.S., for instance, for for example, we went hiking. Uh, with a short with those, uh, reduced groups of five people. And I think the main thing there was testing our communication, testing the way of working rather than accomplishing the task we were assigned to. So these kind of trainings, I think, helps you strengthen your, your mental stability. Yeah, absolutely. So, so what you guys are doing is you guys are working together as a team to successfully accomplish missions in, in, in the most extreme environments on Earth before you go and embark on this kind of mission out in space. So you're really testing your limits on Earth as a team before you do something like that. And that's the sort of mental, psychological preparation, at least, you know, within a certain limit, the most extreme uh, before you go in and do something like, you know, going out in space and doing the, you know, the, the, it's the real deal. Um, what I'm curious about is, when you do have these frustrations, either on an individual basis or on a team basis, how do you typically handle something like that? And can you maybe take us through a frustration that you've experienced and how it was successfully managed? Yes, let me think a bit about it, just to put a good example. Um, the, I, I would say the, the statement here would be rely on your team. Uh, special mental frustrations you cannot handle uh, handle them by yourself 90% of the times and and mental frustration and related uh, episode happen to you because you're a human at the end of the day so in my case I've had a few of them of course during uh, training sessions I always relied on my team I can put you maybe a couple of examples first one uh, was uh, we were diving we were doing uh, underwater activities we had to fix something underwater that was broken and you cannot communicate underwater, so you need to uh, find a way to express your message without voice. Uh, you can use your hands, you can uh, try to point at something or just find a solution. That's why we trained, right? So um, it, was, uh, it was my bad, actually. I, I didn't read well the statement. I didn't read well what we had to do to fix the, the issue. And I, I thought that everyone was doing the opposite thing that we were supposed to do and we were timed so there was nothing that I could do because I was the only one that was thinking about this and and I was able under the water to make my team know that I was having this issue I was literally saying what are, why are we doing this we should go this way we should try this and do that and they understood what was happening to me and they took me they took me back to the starting point we checked the instruction, not one time, not two, but three. And then uh, we agreed, I am, I understood. I, I just needed my help. I, do, I just needed help of the team to do that. Uh, another option, another example, I'm sorry, um, was uh, during hiking, for instance. Um, hiking was, uh, was tough because uh, not everyone has the same physical condition and you need to adapt, you need to work as a team, you need to uh, identify what can you provide to the team Sometimes you can provide, I, don't, I would say you can be plus one. Some other times you are a minus one uh, and others, most of them, you're a zero. Uh, I think national job is aiming to be a zero always because it's very risky to be a plus one because you might turn yourself into a minus one. And wow. in that case, during, during hiking, um, 
it was uh, it was especially this because uh, I was the youngest there, and I was trying to carry the team physically, same on the mountains to get to the points we were supposed to go, and and then I realized that that it was hard for my colleagues to follow me and to 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 keep on with my pace with my pace, so. That's why um, I saw them, and I, it was not a thing of relying on the team this time. But I, I saw the condition. I, I thought of what I could do to just calm myself down and not think about the objective, but think about the teamwork we were supposed to do, and sacrifice the objective, put the frustration away, and focus on achieving everything as a team. And uh, we took the measures, uh, for example. Uh, carrying each other's bags or just slowing down a little bit or uh, discussing things a little bit more and it was a, a matter of minutes because we solved it very quickly and we were very very satisfied at the end of the day with uh, with the result and we understood that uh, it was not about the objective it was more about the procedure and the process and so what are some signs and symptoms that you're able to pick up on that show you that maybe what you would otherwise consider an advantage can now become a, a disadvantage when it comes to being a team member? Sometimes um, when it's like the, wanting to take the leadership of something just because you think you're a leader, uh, maybe it's not the best option for your, for your team. Uh, we people tend to, to think like this sometimes and it's very difficult to identify your capabilities alongside with those from the team. And when you do that, sometimes you understand you're not maybe the most experienced person in doing this. And for me, that was an essential part of my contribution to the team. And I was very satisfied with it because I, I understood that everyone was better than me at everything. So I could uh, delegate the tasks that were needed to be delegated to my, to my team. If I were uh, the leader, if I were the leader, I, I, if I had uh, extra initiative, if I risk the the well-being of my team for accomplishing the results instead of being a plus one, which would be helping to accomplish the results, it would be a minus one because um, the outcome would uh, would have been the the optimal for the for the mission. You have to think that for a national, when they are investing millions and millions of dollars to train an astronaut, especially not, not the astronaut itself, but the mission, the, the science that goes into it, the, the rocket, the launch, everything, you cannot mess up. You, you, you cannot be a hero. You cannot be a minus one. So just better stay at the zero and be, as I said at the beginning, uh, one piece of the puzzle to make everything happen. That's that's uh, very well said, and I'm wondering, you know, you mentioned delegating. Under what circumstances do you think it's appropriate to delegate, and how can we delegate from a true leadership role? First of all, uh, there is uh, the, the need to understand that we are all humans, and people has to learn, has to uh, go, uh, has to continue growing and follow the, the learning curve. So when you delegate, you cannot expect that things are going to be done the way you do it. And you have to trust your team. That's the essential part. Trust is essential not only in uh, in the astronaut field, but for, for anything in life, right? Um, trusting your colleagues, knowing that maybe some things that might, might have to be fixed um, and, and being uh, be willing to fix it is uh, it's the basis. It's the basis. Just transmitting this confidence to the team, transmitting the confidence that if they mess up, you're going to be there for them. It's essential, uh, and and the rest is history. Everyone does his best, and and sometimes things go well, and sometimes they don't go that well. But you are there to support the the outcome and try to fix it or just make it better. So I would love to continue to dive into this team effort, some of the missions and the training. But before we do that, um, I think it's essential for the audience to understand your background a little better and your progression throughout the years, both personally and professionally. So if you can maybe, uh, you know, color that in for us a bit and tell us 
what that journey's looked like, I think we would uh, appreciate it quite a bit. Well, just I, I'm going to try to be uh, short because, you know, when you talk about yourself, you can uh, <laughs> lose the, the sense of time. Um, yeah. Since I was a kid, as I told before, I was very, very keen at, at space science, at space exploration. I was a very sportive person, so I, I used to play basketball all of my life. I'm a black belt in Taekwondo. I've, I've been in many, many championships uh, here in Europe. And, and in parallel, I was, I was doing my, my studies. Uh, as I said before, I always make sure to do whatever I like. So my interests are not really circumscribed only to, to space. I also like uh, journalism. I work for a newspaper. I, I went to, to China to study economics for a couple of months also. So I think space is the place I want to be, but does not mean, does, that doesn't mean that the space has to be your whole life. So I think my life has followed this, uh, this statement for these 25 years and and well I, I started university I started aerospace engineering two years ago I finished actually uh, a year ago I finished my master's degree after six years of studying and now I'm working in the space sector with with launchers especially I'm working for a software systems company and that we do basically software critical software for launchers for satellites for launch bases especially in Europe we have permanent office in French Guiana, which is where the, the launchers, the European rockets are being launched from Euro, which is curious because it's not in Europe, it's in, the, in French Guiana, it's in the Amazon River, it's in, the, in the, the Amazon rainforest, just right next to Brazil. You actually can pay with Euros because it's supposed to be France, but it's a pretty curious uh, area because it's very near the equator and being near to the equator to launch rockets is, is optimal for saving fuel, for saving money. And we're getting better results. So I work for for launchers. I'm traveling a lot now. I'm getting to know the industry. I work in the in the business area now. So I'm getting to know all parts of what a project uh, is, from the project management, from the technical implementation parts, and also from the economic and financial aspects. So I'm think now. I think now I'm learning a lot. I'm, I'm lucky to have my colleagues with me that are understand me, understand my, my skills and my, my immature situation, which is obvious because my, my manager is like 25 years old to 25 years older than me, sorry. So this huge gap helps me to uh, have an example and, and learn. And if people is willing to teach you, it's, it's amazing. This is on my professional side. I also perform astronaut training with Advancing X. Um, this, is, this is a startup in, uh, in the US, in North America, devoted to optimizing team design and, and applying that to, to astronaut training to people so people can actually improve their training capabilities and procedures when they go to space, especially in the near future with the blooming of the new space market. And I'm contributing with the rest of my colleagues to setting a, a baseline, a reference of how a, an astronaut should be physically, mentally, and so on. For instance, I have this watch with me that is uh, recording my, my health, my, my data during the day, along with that of my colleagues. And it's helping advancing us to set a standard, to set a reference, so they can have this pool of data. And of course, I also travel to the premises or to anywhere I'm required to, to perform training to be studied um, in Spain, we say it Conejillo de Indias. I would say that would be the best example is when you are this rabbit in the laboratory and they are making tests on you. And I, and I feel like this, and I think that's the job of an astronaut also, right? Being this uh, experiment subject. So um, I'm performing training underwater. Uh, there's a survival, drone reconnaissance, um, hiking. Um, so yeah, uh, that's that's what I do in the in the astronaut field, of course, and I have many many other ambitions and, and hobbies, which are infinite. So <laughs> if you want to know a little bit more about them, we'll we can talk about them later. Yeah, sweet. You know, one question that I have for you, considering that you're playing such an important and unique leadership role with what you're doing, is how do you keep yourself humble? 
you know, especially, you know, you're working with a lot of people that are so much older than you that have more maybe knowledge and experience, but how do you keep yourself humble and in a position where you're constantly learning? How do you limit, let's say, arrogance and, uh, I would say it's a matter of respect. Uh, respect is the word in this case, uh, respecting, uh, people's time, people's background, people's opinion. That's, that's what drives you in, in the professional world and in the, in the astronaut field also, uh, hearing other people's advice. It's always good, even if even if you don't really need it or you're not going to follow it, just having perspective on on your actions is, is good. And and that's the way. I mean, there's no way you're not being humble in because you're not achieving nothing. You are pro, you are projecting an image of you that you might not even look like that in real in real life. So at the end of the day, uh, having respect for people and appreciating the time they are devoting to teach you, to give you presence in the activities they're doing and and give you chances to, to grow and to develop yourself. It's very, very, well, I'm very grateful for that. And where do you see these efforts, you know, playing the unique roles that you're playing, where do you see this in the next five to 10 years? It's very, it's very difficult to answer this question because if I knew the answer, I think life would be very boring, right? <laughs> you yeah. know where you're going to be makes no sense right uh yeah i would say uh in five to ten years which is not a long time actually i would see myself uh growing in the same direction i'm growing now not i, I don't want to stop learning a single moment or at least try to of course there's all there's always phases in your life but but learning has to be there all, always so i'm see i see myself learning contributing to space the same or even more that I'm doing now and being able to take part in actual missions, analog missions, uh, maybe being more close to the astronaut world, to the astronaut uh, figure uh, around it, helping uh, space exploration push now, especially more that we are trying to colonize the moon. Uh, I think it's a, in five years, it's going to be a great time to, to be alive and contribute to, to these developments. And do you see yourself as someone who would end up living on the moon or somewhere else in space? Is that a realistic reality, something on the horizon for you? Yeah, why, why not? I mean, if, it, if that wasn't the case, uh, uh, I wouldn't want it to be an astronaut. Um, I wouldn't want to be an astronaut in the, in the, in the sense that, uh, of course, I, I see myself, but I'm also, uh, I also consider I'm also... Uh, I'm sorry, I don't know how to say this. Uh, I'm also aware. No, I know to get it. <laughs> <laughs> no, I'm also aware of of the difficulties that are linked to being an astronaut. Uh, as I mentioned before, the physical capabilities, the the mental and the technical uh, skills that you need to to possess are not easy. So, not being an astronaut is not something that wouldn't bother me or wouldn't frustrate. Um, I would I would say one of the things that might disqualify you for being uh, an astronaut is one of these, not being frustrated if you are not an astronaut. There was a, mm -hmm. this, uh, this rumor in the last uh, astronaut selection process, not two years ago, but 10 years ago, uh, was a question of the, of the astronaut selection was, uh, if we have the technology to go to Mars, uh, but not to come back, and you have the chance to be the first colonizers uh, in Mars, would you be willing to go? And if you answered yes, that was automatically key. Uh, that would disqualify you in the way that even though it might seem that you are giving your life for space exploration and you want to be an astronaut so hard that you're willing to sacrifice everything on Earth to go to Mars, <clears throat> actually proves that you might not be mentally very stable to be willing to do all of this, right? So <laughs> I can't believe it. Yes. So this was an actual question and it's an example of, of how not being an astronaut cannot be an essential part of your day, your by day and your life goals. It's something abstract. It's, it's something abstract that goes in parallel to your life. And that you have to be ready just ever if the moment comes, uh, just be ready for it. But as long as it doesn't come, just keep enjoying yourself and doing what you like to do. 
That's really interesting because if I think for example, and maybe a lot of people that are tuning in right now, if, if we think to ourselves like, man, you know, I really want to be an astronaut, you have to think about these questions, right? All right like, what if I get trapped in space? Is it something that I'm willing to do and willing to sacrifice? But now, <laughs> what that really shows us is more an element of instability rather than de dedication. And, 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 you know, so when you first came across this example, what did you think for yourself? And, and are you personally... You know, not you know what what, what would you, what did you answer or what would you answer i think i know this, the answer but what if you can take us through that thought process this was uh 2013 i was uh was a high school and i had the very first chance of my life to get in touch with the european space agency so i went there and and i was talking to one of the guys that was involved in the selection process and he asked me this question right i was a kid and i said yes i was willing to go to mars i was willing to <laughs> to sacrifice for humankind and then, and then he made me so things in perspective, and I said, okay, that's maybe not a good step for being for, for for being an astronaut and for training to be an astronaut. So you might reconsider your your priorities in life. Oh my goodness! And how did you react? Were you embarrassed? Were you shocked? Were you scared? What what, what was going through your mind? No, I wasn't. I was I was shocked because you know when you're a kid and. And you're very sure that your answer is this, and then you get the opposite uh, outcome. Um, it shocks you, but I was so nervous to being in front of a spaceman, a space guy, and talking to to him in a private conversation that I I I didn't have a single chance to be nervous. I was nervous all the time. Uh, it was not a matter of this question, and it's something that made me reflect um, a, li a little bit of course at that moment but even more during the years to have understanding mm -hmm. the the nature of, of being an astronaut which is as i said before being a normal person and so when you get like with a question like this is it a multiple choice like yes or no answer or can you is it like a short response because i personally feel that if no is the right answer at least i need an opportunity to describe why not you know so that they don't think that i'm just afraid to be an astronaut and, 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 and unconscious of the danger that that entails because it is a real danger. You're putting your life at risk. So I'm not sure if it was a yes or no answer. Uh, I can introduce you a little bit to the astronaut selection process. You just begin with your, your basic profile, your CV, some random questions, some random but very long questions because sometimes they put like five, 50 questions on purpose. So they make sure you are willing actually to go on with the application process. So mm -hmm. you answer a bunch of, this, of different questions, and then you do an assessment. You do a, uh, a PC assessment with uh, some technical and mental um, activities and challenges, very, very similar the, to that from the pilots, airline pilots go through, and military pilots too, a spatial, uh, spatial um, vision, uh, mathematics, uh, visual memory, et cetera, et cetera. And then you go through an interview. This interview is person. It's in, it's in person. It's in front of uh, one, two, three people, and you get asked questions. So if that question was during this interview process, of course there's many other interviews and medical exams after that. But if that question was during this interview process, I don't think it will be a yes or no question. And I would say you have the chance to explain yourself and have being able to explain yourself and 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 say things in in the way you see them and just provide perspective, it's part of all, also of the interview and it's part of your communication capabilities and skills. It's interesting because one thing that you're, like I'm, what I'm reflecting on right now is a lot of the skills that it takes to be a leader and to be a good candidate for almost any role. And one of those characteristics tends to be, you know, risk tolerance and, and some would even call it bravery, but it seems to me like in this instance, those two things, have used, as you've described, the, the plus one, uh, this specific scenario, these things will work against you. So how would you define leadership within this community of people on these missions? I would say within a, a crew of astronauts, of space astronauts, analog astronauts, whatever, uh, leadership uh, comes in the in the way of sharing this this word 
of course there's people that might support that there's there should be only one leader and the natural process is having only one leader in a group but there's many areas in many aspects that need to be addressed within a crew and not a single person can hold on all of them so usually in the space crews the leader the commander of the mission is the one that has more experience that knows how astronauts behave more uh, behave in space the most and and is trained to be a commander but the commander is not responsible for everything in a crew you have your commander which is maybe the main contact point between the, the, the space station and the mission control center but you also have a health officer that doesn't happen to be the commander you have a physical and engineering officer uh, a communications officer you have many many charges because leadership is not only in one person's hand especially in the space that you cannot rely on one single person because of mental and physical constraints that we were discussing before so in this case leadership comes in the way of sharing, of delegating, and knowing what you do best and trying to get the most out of your team. When you're wrong about something, how do you communicate that to other people? How do you admit that you're wrong? Usually when you're wrong, sometimes you don't even know you're wrong. It's I, I would say people uh, use the word empathy a lot, but it's actually very difficult to be empathic it's very difficult to put yourself in other people's skin and the first step to do this or just to see things into perspective is to make this exercise and to know you're wrong you have to do this once you know you're wrong uh, you need to take your pride put it into your pocket as we say in Spain and being able to recognize your mistake because that's the only way things are going to get better and that's the only way the whole team is going to work to solving this mistake because if you don't say that, if you don't communicate, you're going to be the one that is going to be trying at least to solve it. But in, a, in this scenario, you cannot solve it by yourself most of the time. So you need to communicate to put your ego and, and your, your beliefs that might be wrong apart and communicate and, and getting help from others. And, and, uh, uh, Similar but different question is how do you know when to ask for help and are you guys trained to have these kinds of conversations when you don't know something, when you're unsure about something? How early on do you communicate this and how do you know when it's appropriate to ask for help? Of course, training is there, but you were humans at the end of the day. So people is also trained to see your mistakes, to see your human uh, communication, your body language, your 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 results your outcomes of what you're doing uh, analyzing your 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 team your team's behavior is important to preserve the integrity and the and the current development of a mission so you're always trained to communicate and to of course not trained but you are getting used to know the people and get confidence and trust them so you can actually feel comfortable to express yourself but it's also a work of a task of others to identify that you might be in trouble and you might need some help when you even you don't even know yet if you need it or you don't want to say it. so it's a it's a training that is not only one way but both ways the team and the person and as far as the advancing x team building algorithm goes how have you seen the influence of that in supporting you and your team um, it's curious because before joining, joining Advancing X, I didn't really believe in algorithms to, to analyze people because it's, I was like, we're humans, it's very complex to, to study one by just uh, performing some tests and doing some activities and challenges. Then uh, we arrived in California um, a few months ago and I was, uh, when I was mixed with a team that was very, very different from me. Um, there was me, there was a, one of my colleagues, he was around 60 years old. He was very, very experienced in many, many areas of space exploration, not only technical, but also physical, because he's the, the guy has, that has performed the most uh, parabolas, parabolic flights in the world. So he's very, very experienced. Right. Can, can you describe to the people tuning in what, uh, what that means, what a parabolic flight is? Yeah, sure. 
parabolic flies is a way to experience microgravity conditions for a short peri period of time, um, especially if you want to carry experiments, if you want to carry out also uh, training procedures for astronauts. So what you do is you get into your plane, you, high, uh, you fly up high, and then you stop the engine, basically, and you fall down. You fall down for maybe one minute, and in that moment, you experience microgravity. The feeling is something similar as when you are in a roller coaster, or if you, you are, I hope not, but if you are in the elevator and the rope breaks, in that moment, you are in microgravity, right? So what you do, you perform this maneuver a few times. So what you're doing is you are forming a parabola with the airplane. You're going up and down, up and down. Of course, everyone is throwing up. Everyone has difficulties. But at the end of the day, it's the, the best way to experience microgravity for a limited period of time. Of course, there's other ways to do that, to do it. Uh, underwater, for instance, is very common. Or maybe when you're working with experiments, dropping the experiment for a very high, from a very high tower, maybe you have 10 to 15 seconds of microgravity. So parabolic flight is a way to experience this. And in this case, my colleague, uh, I don't know if he has 3,000 or 5,000 parabolas during his lifetime. Wow. So he had the world record. He was a very experienced guy. Then we have a girl from the US, which uh, uh, she's a, a veterinary. Then we have uh, another girl from the UK. Sorry, which, if I can interrupt you for just a second. Uh, how does someone with her background play a role in space veterinary? Sorry? What what kind of role is she playing? You said her background is she's a veterinarian. Yes, yes, yes. Uh, she's yeah. a veterinarian. Uh, uh, I would say her skills align more with the medical skills, and he happens to have had a lot of analog missions in the past, so she had a lot of experience in team dynamics, in work dynamics. Of course, much more than uh, than me. So her role was, of course, the the medical side, but also the experience of being having been part of many many missions in the past and of course her love for space and space science and we had another girl she was a, she's a scientist from the UK and it was us for uh, these girls had uh, around 40 year olds 40 year and 30 year old so I was the uh, the youngest one and each one of us was very very different from each other very different and we happened to get along very well. We were very fortunate and we were saying that to each other. And we had clear, maybe not from since the first moment because it's very difficult, but after the first activity, it was clear the, the capabilities of each one and how we were coordinating and how we should coordinate in the future. So we, we got along very well. We knew, of course, how to deal with uh, the personality of each other because that was our job. Our job was to work in a team and we have to do our best to try to adapt to our teammates and I think we achieved it and we were very happy with the with the outcome and at the end of the day we were able to perform the the last task as if was a, as, it, as if it was a choreography all the movements were studied even though uh, I had this issue I was mentioning at the beginning underwater even then uh, we were able to solve it and and that's maybe a reason of why uh, algorithms and optimal team design is there to help building these teams that maybe from a first sight might not seem optimal, especially because everyone is so different from each other, but being different makes also complement each other very, very well. Wow. And are there any specific things that the algorithm picked up? Like when you, because I, have spoken with Eduardo about the algorithm and we actually did a podcast in, in, in the past about it, but when you actually put everything into this equation, into this formula, what does it relay back to you? Does it relay back individual characteristics about each person so that you know these things ahead of time or do they just kind of match people and then expect you to like make them make the best of it in the spot? You know, does it give you some feedback that you can then work on or is it just like here, just put these people together? Yes, um, the feedback of the algorithm is, uh, is uh, as long as I know, is kind of confidential. So the feedback I receive uh, is the one that, in this case, Advancing Guys is willing to provide me, which is uh, my capabilities to work within a team 
the, the capabilities I have to manage several tasks is like Luke, Alejandro, you are able to manage one task at a time, five tasks at a time, ten tasks at a time. You may not be comfortable with in this kind of situations, in this kind of, um, of activities because you are not made for it. That's maybe the, the outcome, the, the most simple and straightforward outcome of the algorithm is how would you work within a team and how would you handle some situations, some common situations. And so in a way, it does give you these strengths and weaknesses. And with that information, are you then given instruction on improving some of the weaknesses? Or do you focus on building the strengths? Or does it just kind of give you this information and then you do as you please? Like once you have this in your hands, is there any instruction about what to do with the positive and the negative? I would say the, the, the purpose of the OTI test is not improving yourself, but describing yourself. And it's not something you can improve, but it's everyone is different. So what, what is improving actually, uh, what does improve actually means, um, it's not about improving, it's about describing, knowing how you, uh, what do you do your, uh, sorry, um, uh, I was confused. It's about knowing how, what are your strengths, what are your weaknesses, but not your weaknesses that you can work on, but your natural weaknesses. It's like you're human, you're not really perfect, so it's not possible to have everything at the top. In this way, you could not be an astronaut for sure because you would be a robot. So uh, the OTI test aims at identifying your strengths, but not with the aim of improving them, but with the aim of matching you to the best optimal team possible. Okay, so in a way, uh, you've used the, this puzzle analogy, and I think it it does work nicely in that what you're describing now is you are able to determine where you fall in the masterpiece and what your edges look like. So you know exactly what position, what role you play, but you're not told, hey, you know, you need to improve this or that. It's like, this is just, a, this is, as a matter of fact, where you are and how you fit into this bigger picture. So that's, that's what you're describing, correct? Yeah, at least that's what the study supports. Uh, of course, we are, we are people and, and you never know what's going to happen in the future, but the, the test supports that if you are, if you have a score in, in, in 10 years from now, you're going to have the same or very similar score. So uh, this particular study supports that it is a description of your behavior rather than a baseline from you can wear, uh, work. Of course, what you say is, has a lot of sense. No, you know your edges, you should work or you can work in improving your edges. But, but the OTI, in this case, uh, it doesn't seem to agree with that, right? But, but of course, uh, from a human point of view, I would agree with you. Uh, and I would say that, of course, working in your weaknesses and realizing what your weaknesses are is very, very important. And how do you, weakness, how, how do you witness or how do you realize about this with perspective, with uh, others' advice, with your team support? So it always comes to teamwork and to relying on your on your mates to 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 carry on with life and, and continue developing your, your strengths. You know, I'm curious if there's a way to sort of separate this information, this feedback into what is and isn't actionable for you as far as what you, you can improve. But either way, I'm curious also as as far as how this kind of test and algorithm has influenced you beyond this career in this professional setting, you know, in your other relationships and your within your other hobbies and interests, have you found that having this information and this description of yourself, has it been useful for you? Yeah, I think, of course, it's something that knowing it is a uh, it's better than not knowing it, especially in the professional in the professional field. And um, when you know, for example, I have this, this, this and that, but I know that if I meant this this way, I'm not going to be able to handle it very well because that's what the OTI said, uh, makes you prevent it and planify it so you can not, so you don't see yourself in that situation. So uh, knowing your, your profile, uh, it's, it's always helpful to planify, to prevent and to optimize. Maybe what you were saying before that uh, this test might be a chance to 
improve your capabilities or maybe work on them, maybe an interpretation could be this, helping you to planify to get your best, knowing yourself it's a way of improving. Wow. And I know that this kind of algorithm and test isn't widely available to the public, but do you think that there's other means by which people can get to know themselves better so that they can be the best versions of themselves and better team members? Is there other things that they can do to kind of be real with themselves about who they really are? Of course, I, I would say the, the, the first thing that comes to my mind, as with everything I said in the, in the podcast, is, um, is life experience, uh, learning from life experience, not only experiencing things, but also learning from them, being able to recognize your, your behavior, your actions in the, in the past, either if they are good, if they are bad, if they are neutral, but being able to recognize them and being able to put everything into perspective and hearing others' advice is a way is the only way for me that you can learn and you can grow as a person. Sometimes they say you have to be, uh, you have to go through really harsh or really traumatic episodes to to grow and to be uh, an adult. I, I I wouldn't agree with that, but what I would agree is that you need to learn from your experiences and you need to learn because in my job especially uh, there's a lot of, of human communication there's a lot of uh, knowing uh, the place you are at, at a certain time and knowing how to communicate and how to behave and the first thing that uh, I've seen now especially in this kind of situations where I'm the youngest by far it's that you are not born with this it's something that you learn how do you learn this studying these experiences, uh, trying, be willing, be willing, having the, the, the courage to improve and, and using the resource to, to learn and to make yourself a better person. And when you're doing this kind of training, when you're preparing for these missions, you know, what does the discourse after the mission look like? You know, cause what I'm, what I'm, what I'm seeing now is that, you know, you, one of your biggest strengths and, and really a necessity in order to play this role is you have to be able to learn from these experiences and the missions themselves are these big experiences. So how do you guys organize yourselves to have these conversations after the, the, the mission? You know, the, the, the briefings are never like how you expect them to be. And that's the, the beauty of it. It's like uh, when they tell you something that you did wrong uh, and you were not expecting to hear that, it's a chance to, to improve and to have a little bit of, a sp of perspective other than your of perspective other than, than your own eyes. So the briefing procedures not only should be done within the team and within the crew, but also within the observers, within uh, in the space field, within the mission control center, within the rest of the staff that is surveilling, that is working on the mission, having all these kind of opinions, all these kind of perspectives helps you realize that maybe some things that you were expecting them to be right are not and in all the briefings there's always something that you aren't really expecting and it comes out and it's it's actually a, a very very beautiful ten, chance to to take that as a as an advice and and look it into perspective sometimes you don't want to hear it sometimes you thought you you thought you performed well and you didn't do anything wrong which is impossible so uh, hearing this, it's also a way of humbling yourself. As you mentioned a few questions ago, uh, all of these kind of situations make your make, make yourself improve at the end of the day. And how I know that we've examined this a little bit, and we are running out of time. But the last, the second to last question that I have for you here is: How are you able to put your ego aside, not take things personally, and really build a constructive mindset so you can be the best version of yourself and the best member of your team. When you do these debriefings, how do you lay the foundation for that kind of growth? It's impossible to do that. It's impossible because we are human. So you're going <laughs> to always have ego. There's always going to be this. And, and how you work on this is the key. And how your team works on you is also the key. Because sometimes you are going to show up your ego or your discrepancy a little bit more than expected 
and your team needs to deal with that and needs to be prepared to deal with that. So this is one side and the other side on your own self. You need to work, uh, you need to be uh, bear in mind that the importance of the mission goes beyond you. The importance of what you're doing goes beyond your own person because that's why you became an astronaut, to contribute to society and society is way bigger than you. So that's uh, uh, the simplest way to, to understand everything is uh, knowing the scope of, of what you're doing. And, and actually, be doing this is a way to feel happy and to be part of it. It's a, it's a way of very, very fulfilling, even though, even though it, you are not a astronaut, you are part of the mission and, and be willing to understand the magnitude of what you're doing. It's a way of humbling you. It's a way of putting your ego apart at least a little bit. Of course, it's, not, it's never going to be 0%. But it should be as reduced as possible, and at the end, you're contributed to something big. So that that's you just blew me away because what you what you said that to, to paraphrase is you can't take these things personally, make it about you because this mission is so much bigger than you, and I think that's a reminder for anyone that's working on an important mission yeah, is recognize that it's big, it's bigger than themselves. Uh, last question I have for you, and this is just very brief, is. You know, you're a young guy, you're very accomplished, you have a massive amount of responsibility that you're handling on a day-to-day -day basis. If you could put a message, one sentence on a billboard somewhere for 20 to 30-year-olds to see, appreciate, and reflect on, what would that billboard say? You can take a moment to think about it if you'd like, but if you're ready to go. I would say, um, from a privileged perspective, because we know society is difficult and, and, and sometimes uh, you're not in the best situation and you need to do yourself, you, you, do, you need to do things to, to carry on and to, to go on with life. So from this privileged position that we are now, I, I would say that in life you have to do everything that you want as long as it makes you happy. So don't synchronize, don't stick to one single thing. Try to do as much of things as you want and try to be happy with it. That will be an absolute privilege. That's the definition for me of happiness is, is being able to, to work on things that motivate you and to, that fulfill you. Alejandro, what a pleasure, what an honor. Thank you so much, man. This has been so much fun and I've, I've learned so much and I can't wait to see what the audience takes away from this. Thank you, Thank you. I appreciate, appreciate your work and, and your platform and I hope the show goes on and skyrockets. <laughs> Thank you so much. From a, from a rocket scientist himself, an astronaut himself. <laughs> I appreciate that. Thank you. Appreciate it.